welcome back to our machine learning one course. Today we are going to talk about multiple linear regression, which is linear regression with more than one predictor. So the example that I had last time was predicting the height of a person from the person's age, right? So you have one predictor, the age, you, your response, as it's called, response variable height, um, is also just one dimensional, it's just height that you're predicting. Um, so you have two parameters, beta zero and beta one, intercept and slope, um, that describe your regression line that you can draw in two dimensions uh, very easily. So for each value of x, uh, which is just a number, you get some value of y, which is also just one number, right? So that's a function. Today, we want to talk about a situation where you have two or possibly more predictors. So if you have two predictors, let's say you don't just have age, but maybe you have a gender or, or um, you know, any other, the, the, the weight um, possible uh, number describing a person. So let's say you just have two, we'll call them x1 and x2, that's your predictors, and you're still predicting the height. Now, you need three dimensions to draw that, and instead of a regression line, you have a regression plane. So we'll still be talking about fitting a linear function, that's a linear regression. Um, but now it's a regression plane. For each combination of x1 and x2, over here, you should be getting one value of y, and this defines um, a plane, how to parameterize a plane, you need three numbers. You need an intercept beta zero, and then beta one and beta two are the slopes, like in the direction of x1 and the direction of x2. Just think about a tilted plane um, living in this three-dimensional space. If you, so last, last time we talked about loss uh, function a lot. Um, so for the one-dimensional case, we have two parameters, beta zero and beta one, and we have a loss surface, um, that we can nicely visualize in 3D and clearly has a minimum there. If you have two predictors, you have three parameters, so to, in order to draw a loss surface, I would need four dimensions, which is why there's no picture here. And if you have more predictors than that, which is often what you do, you have a lot of predictors, then you're lost. There's, there's no way to visualize a loss surface anymore. So this means that conceptually, what we're going to do today is actually not more complicated than what we had last time. It's the same thing. We just want to generalize the simple linear regression to the uh, general case of any number of predictors. However, technically, it's quite a bit more complicated because you need to deal with the, with the high dimensionality and with uh, multiple predictors and multiple betas and you need to keep track of everything. So, one usually writes it down in, in a matrix form, in a vector form. Um, so today, it's going to be a little bit technical uh, lecture where we'll try to develop the formalism that will allow us to, to write these things down easily. Okay, so let's start with that. So our model here for, uh, for multiple linear regression is a linear function of P predictors. So I will always use P to denote the total number of predictors that one, that one has in the model. Remember that the sample size goes from one to n, and p and, and, and predictors go from one to p, and there's additional beta zero, which is the intercept. So you have p plus one um, parameters uh, in your model, given p predictors. This is a little bit cumbersome to write down like that, so I will never do this again. It is convenient to write it down in a vector form, and for that, it is convenient, in addition, to define x0 so that this beta 0 over there doesn't just hang, you know, like that without x1 and looks different from everything else. Let's try to write it more symmetric. So we'll just define x0 as equal to 1 always. So x0 is just another way to write 1 for me. And if we do that, we can assemble all x's from 0 to p in a vector. I will call it vector x. And we assemble all betas from 0 to p in a vector beta. And then what we have there as our linear function is just a scalar product, which I assume everybody knows, of these two vectors, beta and x, right? Because the scalar product, by definition, is the sum um, overall coordinates of the, of, of the product um, 
of the coordinates of these two vectors. Um, another way to write exactly the same thing, and the way, the way that is more standard in, in statistics, in machine learning, textbooks, and that I will also adopt here in these lectures, is not to, to write down these vectors signs, but I will just use bold uh, font to denote a vector. So whenever you see uh, a bold x, it, mean, it means it's a vector, and a bold beta also refers to a vector. And then to denote scalar product, I will write it like that, beta transpose times x, which, uh, which uh, so that's what it means. So the, I will assume always here that a vector is a column vector. So if I just write bold x, it means it's a column vector with all the coordinates sitting one under another as here. And then if it's a transpose of the, of the, of the vector beta, then it's a row from beta 0 all the way here to the beta p. And I'm not writing the, the, the dot anymore, but I assume that this is then a, a matrix multiplication between these two matrices now, not just vectors, but really think about that as a, as a, as a very simple matrices. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about matrix multiplication in a moment. Here, it just means that you multiply beta zero with x zero, beta one with x one, and you sum all up, and it's the same thing as above, and it's just a different way to write it. Very simple. Okay. So that's the function, beta times x. Let's now, to pr let's now proceed to write the loss function, right? So the loss function is now a function of the bold beta. Um, and we'll use the same loss as before, so that's a mean squared error. So the mean squared error means that you sum over all training samples from 1 to n. You, well, you actually average, that's why there's 1 over n in front of the sum. Um, now I will use this funny bracket notation, which is a little bit cumbersome, to denote the ith training example. So the yi in brackets is just one number. That's what you're predicting for the. So that's the value of height in our example in the in the ith train training example number i. And uh, here beta times x is um, the output of the model of of our linear um, linear regression model that takes xi, which is a vector of all predictors for the same training example, and also beta times x is just one number, that's the prediction, we subtract yi from the prediction, we get an error, we square an error, then we average, so we get a mean squared error. Good. Remember what we now need in order to proceed with that. So we have a loss function, and then either, no, without either, we just compute the gradient of that, and then we either use gradient descent, to go step by step towards the minimum, or we say the gradient is zero, let's try to find analytical solution for where the gradient is zero for this point. So either way, we need the gradient, and either way, we need the partial derivatives. So let's try to do that. So we need to compute the partial derivative of this, of this uh, guy over there with respect to beta k, right? So we have p different, we actually have p plus 1 different betas, and so we will have p plus 1 partial derivatives. So I'm taking one of them, which I just denote as k here, it can be any number between 0 and p, and I'm computing the partial derivative, which is nothing else than, um, so it's, it's a derivative of the square, right? So the 2 goes in front, um, and what do you have in front? So now you have to think about beta x over here being a sum. So it's a sum of all coordinates. If you are computing the derivative with respect to beta k over here, then of this stays the same, but what goes outside of the bracket is the value that was in that um, term, in that sum. So if, you, if this derivative is with respect to beta k, then that's why here is x, so it's the k coordinate, xk gets outside of the here, and this is the sum of all um, training examples. So this is nothing complicated, but this, as you see, becomes a bit of a mouthful to even pronounce, so make sure to, you know, pause the lecture and, and think about every, every step here so that you understand the formulas. That's important. Now, this is the partial derivative, so you can, you can, we can write it for beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, and so on, until beta p, 
And now we want to combine it into one p plus one dimensional vector, which is called the gradient, as we discussed in the previous lecture. And that's super easy because the, 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 these, these things here and now here on this line are all the same. So we can just say, well, we, we, we just notice that if we want a vector, then we can make this last thing here, the xik, also in a vector notation, write it like that. And every component of this equation will just be what we have here. So that's the vector gradient. And in principle, this is what you need in order to compute, in order to proceed with the gradient descent. Um, there's nothing else that, that, that you need. You can, for any given value of beta, so for example, for your initial guess, given the data that is sitting there fixed and never changes, um, you can compute the value of the gradient, which is a vector, and you change your beta, uh, you make a little step, right, with, a, with, a, with some learning rate, um, in the direction of the negative gradient. Um, however, so in a way we're done, but there's a better way to write that that is more convenient mathematically and more convenient practically, um, and that's uh, to rewrite all of that in a matrix notation. So that's what um, I want to do here. So we have a collection of vectors x, i, every x, i, every vector Every x i is a p plus one dimensional vector, and there's n of them. So we can combine all all of these x data in a matrix that's called in statistics it's called design matrix. Um, and here's how it's going to look. It's the rows. So one row of this matrix corresponds to one training example, right? So we have p plus one columns so that when you take one row you have p plus one numbers in this row and that's your training example number zero one two three four five and so on until n you can also look at the columns and this will be your feature so if you look at the first column that's the value of x1 overall training examples so i will call this a feature vector x1 for example um all values of our, your first feature and then you have p feature vectors plus additional intercept feature vector which is just one 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 um, so in terms of notation if i write x and then one in brackets this means it's a first training example so it's a row and if i write x one in the bottom like over here that uh, refers to the features Right. The matrix is not square. It, it it looks on this slide a little bit square, but it's not, of course. It's uh, it has n rows and p plus one columns. They can be very different. Okay, we will also collect all y values, so the responses, into what we call response vector. So that's a vector of length n that just has y, y1, y2, and so on, y until yn um, combined into one vector. So that's the, the, that's the objects that are very convenient to work with in linear regression, but actually everywhere. So that's, this is a very standard thing. Ah, and by the way, if I write capital bold x like there, or any capital bold non-italic letter, this refers to a matrix. Okay. Um, so uppercase bold matrix, lowercase bold vector, non-bold a number, just a scalar. Okay, so what can we do with these things? We can rewrite everything that we had before. That's what we're going to do here. So if you have x, which is your whole x, your whole predicted data set, and you have some value of beta fixed, how do you compute the predicted values y hat? Well, it turns out you just multiply x by beta, which is super convenient, which is why I say matrix multiplication is very useful here. Um, so let's, let's make sure that everybody understands that. What happens if you take this vector, if, if you take this matrix x, the entire matrix, and multiply it by, uh, by the vector y? So the matrix multiplication, for those of you who, who, who forgot or never saw it before, is... Um, it works like that. You multiply always a row by column. So if you want the first element in the in the result over no, sorry, over here, to get the first element, you take the entire first row here and you take the entire column over here 
and you multiply the first element with the first, the second with the second, and you sum over them. And if you look at what will uh, happen, if you do that, you'll notice that, well, you just get your prediction. So it's, it's beta 0 times x0, then beta 1 times x1, and you go over the whole entire first training example, x1 vector, and then, of course, you obtain y hat 0. Great. And then for the second element, you take the second row. For the third element, you take the third row, and so on, until the n. So if you multiply x times beta, uh, following the definition of matrix multiplication, you just get y hat, which is great. Very simple way to write it then. Can we now write down the loss function somehow, also using this x uh, matrix and uh, beta and y uh, vector notations. Yes, we can, of course. So we need to take that, that equation that we had before, not the equation, just the definition of the L, so the first one, um, over here. That's what was written uh, previously. And now it becomes a little bit cumbersome, so again, pause and think about that to make sure that, that it really follows. So you compute the x, um, x beta product, and this, as we saw before, is just a vector of predictions. So what we need to do, remember, in the mean squared error, you subtract the actual value from the predicted value, and then you square and sum all over. Uh, so that's the sum over there. But then if you take, so you can think about it as a vector of errors, which is the y vector minus y hat vector is the vector of errors. Um, I should have written it down, but I don't have it. So think about the vector of errors. and now you're computing the sum of squared elements of this vector. This is, by definition, a vector norm, which is denoted like it's written here in the end. So we just have 1 over n over the norm of y minus x beta, which is now super simple, right? You just have y, you have x beta, which is a prediction, you subtract, and then there's a norm. Very nice. There's no indices, there's no sums. Um, so it looks great. Much more convenient to write down. Um, so you can write the same thing, which is sometimes useful, as a scalar product of this vector with itself. So it's a vector of errors times the vector of errors transpose. So you just get the squared elements um, um, of this vector. So the norm of any vector is, by definition, a scalar product of this product with itself. That's nothing else uh, is written here. OK, now we need the gradient. So this becomes a little bit also, or may become a little bit confusing. Again, take your time to really make sure that you understand what's, what's, what's happening here, because we are, um, we're taking this equation from top, and previously we had this, this, this form of that. And if you take the derivative of that, so this was worked out previously, you just get this thing over here, right? So it's combined into one vector equation. Now the question is, can we write it somehow without the sum? And the answer is yes, and I'm just writing it down here, so it's not completely obvious that that's the correct way to write it in advance, but you can check that if you take your x matrix, you transpose it, which means you take the matrix that, that was, remember, it had n rows. Transpose means you rotate it 90 degrees. Now it has n columns and p plus 1 rows, and you multiply that by an error vector, y minus x beta, then you will get the same. So each coordinate will be the same as over here in the first part of this, which means that this is the gradient. So really, I recommend to, to write it down on a piece of paper and see that, like, make sure that you see that this matrix multiplication works out uh, like that. This is not a joke. If you don't do that, you will be confused. Well, we will also have exercises that will force you to do that. Um, so a great thing here is that, in fact, if you are familiar with how these calculus, or the derivatives of the matrices work, then you can go directly from here, from this formula, the norm, the y minus x beta, as x beta norm squared as a loss function, directly to here. Well, you need to know how you differentiate the norm, but actually, if you look at that, it's basically the same as, as the school... Um, Calculus, right? You you have something squared, so you're left with two times the same thing times the derivative of what's inside, and the derivatives of what's inside, since you had beta, is just x. So you have x here. So it's wonderful. It just works out. It's a miracle um, that this notation is so conveniently generalizes, you know, the usual standard rules. 
of the um, of one dimensional calculus the only thing that one has to be careful if one does that is for example the transposes so you didn't have any transposes here but here in the bottom there's suddenly x transpose because if if it's not transpose you can't multiply these two matrices um so one either has to really remember how this works or one has to like see which way you can multiply these things so do the sanity checks uh, in your head or you just do the go the hard way and really go coordinate by coordinate and then in the end you can just make sure that well does it make sense yes it seems to make sense okay so that's matrix calculus in a way and and just notice what we have in the end so we we have x the 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 predictors the matrix it it doesn't change the only thing that changes during gradient descent is the beta so for every value of beta we need the value of the gradient, which is a vector, and here one can compute it like that with just with just multiplying these two matrices. It's it's literally one line of code, and importantly, it's not only mathematically simpler to write it in this matrix form compared to the the very confusing form where you need to keep track of where the bracket i is and so on. So mathematically, definitely more convenient to write it like that but also if you implement this in any programming language then um so something you might have heard in especially in the programming languages like python or r or anything that allows you to work with matrices then writing down matrix multiplication by having one matrix and multiplying it by another matrix is much much faster than writing it down by definition you know have the sum over here that that, that goes and, and um, essentially computes the matrix multiplication, this row by column, but, but manually with a for loop. So if you write a for loop that, that, goes, that computes the sum versus you write this in a matrix form and your matrix X is large so that it actually takes an untrivial amount of time, then you will see that the matrix form is faster. And... Um, it's of course less error prone because you just have one line of code instead of looping over your array, keeping track of the indices, uh, and so on. Well, sometimes it is more convenient to work in um, with this explicit notation. So uh, it depends on what you're doing, but um, computationally, definitely, whenever you have a vectorized form, this matrix form, it's 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 very beneficial. All right, so now we have the gradient we can implement the gradient descent. What is the next step on our list? We can find, we can, we can solve it analytically because we can say in this case, in the case of linear regression, we can obtain an analytical solution by saying the gradient is equal to zero. So let's try how it works here. We say, well, here's my gradient. I just say it equals to zero. Uh, I put a hat on beta because that's the condition for beta uh, um, yielding the, the minimum of, of the loss. So now it's a beta hat here, and that's just a linear equation for um, for beta, which should be easy to solve. And it is if you know how how the matrix algebra works. So you, you we um, open the brackets. We of course uh, can get rid of two over n because it's zero on the other side anyway. So we have beta times so this sum matrix x transpose x um, times beta and it equals to some other matrix or vector x transpose y. So x transpose x, let's think for a second about what is x transpose x. So you take your matrix x that has n rows, you transpose that, you multiply it with the matrix x non-transpose, which has n, um, so this now has n columns, this has n rows, you multiply them, you sum over that. So when once once you multiplied, you're left with a square matrix of p times p size, or p plus one times p plus one size. Um, so if everything is well, then you can invert this matrix. So that's something I will just write down here, assuming um Assuming people are more or less familiar with that, if not, we can we can discuss this in the, in our tutorial uh, time. So if this square matrix x transpose x, so how do you solve this function? Well, if it were just numbers, you would say, well, I want to divide by this thing over here, uh, and then you will have the the answer for beta. And in fact, that's what you can do here. 
if this matrix is invertible. So if it's invertible, which it well, let's assume for a second that it is here, then you can invert it like that. And the matrix inverse is a matrix that, so if for any matrix A, a matrix inverse A minus one is defined as a matrix that if you multiply A minus one times A, you get an identity matrix. Identity matrix denoted by I, is a matrix that is zero everywhere apart from the diagonal and has ones on the diagonal. And remember, here we're talking about square matrices. So if you have x transpose x, you multiply it by x transpose x minus one, so inverse of that, you get identity matrix. And if you multiply beta by an identity matrix, you just have beta. So you imagine taking the second row over here and multiplying from the left both sides by this inverse. On the left, you will just be left with beta hat, and on the right, you have this formula uh, because this inverse gets in front of the x transpose y. Um, and that is the analytical solution for, uh, for general case multiple linear regression. So let's compare that um, with what we had before. So in the one-dimensional case, super simple, what I called baby linear regression in previous lecture, that was the, the formula sum of x times y divided by the sum of x squared. Now we have a complicated case, but take a second to appreciate that that's basically the same formula, right? So you have here x transpose y, that's the same here, and here you divide by the sum of x squared. Well, now you have the whole matrix of x squared, x transpose x, but you kind of divide by that because it's matrix inverse. Or let me put it the other way. Imagine, make sure that you understand that if matrix X has just one column, which is what we had in baby linear regression, then the formula in the bottom simplifies to the formula here on the top. Okay, and it does, of course. So it's the same thing, just a general case. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about the role of this X transpose X um, Minus one. And l let me maybe go back and say that, so now we have the analytical solution, and now we have the formula for the gradient in the matrix form, so we can go ahead and, and code uh, and obtain the results, and in a way we're done here, but I want to develop some, some uh, ways that will help you think about that and will help you analyze what goes on with this, with this um, um, with, with these predictions with the, and with this estimation procedure depending on the matrix X. So that's everything that follows in this lecture is a way to analyze um, this equation. Okay, so if we somehow didn't, like magically did not have this term of X transpose X minus one, which is a bit of a confusing term. You have a matrix, then you uh, square matrix, you need to compute an inverse of that, like who remembers even how to compute the matrices on a, on a, um, on a paper, like nobody, I, I, I for example wouldn't be able to do that um, if a matrix is larger than 2 by 2 at least it would be difficult, I would need to remember how to do that so that, that, that is confusing, so if one magically somehow did not have this term had not had this term if it were just identity matrix, then it would simplify a lot. Then we would just have that your beta hat is x transpose y, which is super simple. Everybody can compute that. You just multiply x by y, you're done. So is this, let, let's think, is this ever, is this ever true? Um, well, and in fact, yes, it's, it, it can be true. It can be almost true at least. Um, so let's think about this x transpose x matrix again. The element ij of this matrix, so this means row i column j, is given by the product of scalar product of the two feature vectors, xi and xj. If we want that to be an identity matrix, and then of course the inverse of that is also the identity matrix, um, then it would mean, another way to say that, is that the features are orthonormal. So this term means that they are orthogonal and have norm one, and this means that if you multiply any two features any two different features, xi and xj, for i not equal to j, then you get zero. That means they are orthogonal. That's the definition of being orthogonal. And if you take xi times xi, then you get a norm of xi, and this will be equal to one. So um, 
what does it, so th that's just the condition that we want. So what does it tell us? So, well, features having norm one, that's already clear. Um, let's, let's think about it a little bit about what orthogonal means, especially remembering that the first feature that we have is just the intercept column, right? So it's a column of one, 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 one. That's the whole x0 feature. So if you have x0 times some xj, then the, the scalar product is just the sum of all values of xj, right? So that's what's written over here. If you plug here xi for i0, then this all falls out because these are just ones and you have the sum of, of xj elements and that should be zero. And so zero because the result should be identity matrix which has one on the diagonal and zero everywhere else. So that should be zero. And this means that the sum of the elements is zero which means it just has mean zero. The average of this feature, um, average across all training samples is zero. Okay, um, and now, so let's, let's now remember that all our features, if this condition is true, then all our features have mean zero. If we now multiply xi by xj, where none of them is, is, is the intercept column, we just take two real actual features, multiply them, you get this, this sum over here, and now both of them have mean zero, and the sum is zero. Uh, because that's our condition. So this, in fact, means that these two features are uncorrelated. So in order to see that, if you don't see it immediately, you need to write down the definition of the correlation, um, which is basically almost that. You just need to subtract the means before multiplying, but the mean is zero, so that simplifies to that. Um, so I will leave this also as an exercise to really make sure that you understand what's, what's, what's written here, that it holds. Um, but it actually says that if the features have mean zero, so each feature has mean zero, all pairs of features are uncorrelated with each other, and all features have variance equal to one, then this matrix X transpose X has a particularly simple form, and the, our, whole, uh, our whole solution simplifies such that for each uh, beta, so each... each uh, each predictor beta i, no, sorry, each coefficient beta i can be obtained by just multiplying this feature with the response vector y. And that's all. So e, it means that regression coefficient for each predictor can be computed independently. So instead of having one multiple regression with p predictors and this complicated matrix equation that gives you the betas, if everything is uncorrelated and, and um, has variance equal to one and, and centered, centered and uncorrelated, then you can compute each coefficient separately. So it's like decomposes into p separate regression problems. And that's of course a large simplification. Now, it's, it's, I always say, uh, like the intercept works a little bit separately here. So, but in fact, if all features have mean zero, as we said before, then we can work out the value of beta zero hat that will be optimal, and it's very easy, and I leave this also as an exercise, to show that um, in this case, beta zero hat will just be the average of uh, the average response over all training samples. And notice that if you require that all your features have mean zero, this actually does not affect your prediction in any way, because if you require now that x1 here, for example, has mean zero, it means you subtract from x1 its, its own mean, so you get like beta 1 times the mean of x1 hanging around here, and we can just put it into the intercept. So if you center this, then the intercept will change, but the prediction will stay exactly the same. The same is true for any other features. So it's often very convenient for, especially not so much for implementation, but for mathematical analysis to say, let's imagine that all the features are centered, which means they have mean zero, then the intercept is just the average of a response vector. So if we imagine that the response vector is also centered, also has mean zero, then the intercept is just zero. And we can just forget about that. So what is very convenient to often do to, to, to think about regression problems is to say, let's just imagine that everything is centered. The response is centered, the predictors are centered. We know what the intercept needs to be in order to you know, achieve that. And we can think of, all other coefficients now forgetting about this annoying um, intercept.
Um, you will see why it's useful in a second. But before, um, I want to talk about, um, about the y hat vector here and, and give you a bit of a geometrical intuition behind this, uh, behind this uh, matrix algebra formula. So if you want to predict y, given your x and your model um, coefficients beta, then you just compute x beta, and we have a formula for beta hat already. Um, actually, this misses a hat, so y hat should be x times beta hat, and we have an equation for beta hat before, um, and now if we write it all together, that's, that's, what it get, that's what it is. So it's some complicated looking matrix here, consisting of four times x, yeah, transposed and inversed a little bit, and then multiplied by y. So if you trans this, this, this complicated matrix transforms y into y hat, which is why it's called hat matrix. Hat matrix. Um, and it turns out that one can understand, one can think about this hat matrix as in the projection matrix in the n-dimensional space. So that's a bit confusing the first time you, you think about it like that, but let me try to explain that. We usually think about linear regression as something that happens in p-dimensional space. So each of our training samples is a p-dimensional vector plus an intercept, so maybe p plus one dimensional. But one can, one can turn it upside down and one can think about this happening in the n-dimensional space where this is the sample size. So in the n-dimensional space, the first feature vector is a vector. The, so the feature vectors are just vectors in this n-dimensional space, and the response vector is also a vector there. So if, you, if we have two feature vectors, x1 and x2, then there's a plane that these vectors span, uh, sort of representing the whole predictor matrix x. That's the, let's call it the predictor plane. And now we have the y pointing somewhere off the plane. That's the response. And what I'm claiming is that the whole linear regression solution is nothing else than orthogonal projection of y onto this plane. So y hat is x times beta hat, so it has to lie in the, in the plane. It's a linear combination of feature vectors, so it's, it lies in the x plane. Um, but why, why, is it a, is, why is it an orthogonal projection? So why does orthogonal projection of y onto the x plane give you the y hat? But in fact, that's very easy to see. That's because the, the whole setup is constructed such that we want to minimize y minus x beta hat, right? The residual vector norm should be minimized. So imagine that you have y and you here on the plane find some y hat such that the distance from y to y hat is minimal. What's the answer to that? Well, you just take a linear projection and that's where it's minimal because if it's not a linear projection, then this will be longer. Okay, and another way to see that is to look at the gradient formula that we derived before, which is, which is here, and this is nothing else, so it's equals to zero at the minimum of the loss, but this just nothing else than the condition that the response vector, no, sorry, the error vector here is orthogonal to every feature in, in X. So you can see directly from the loss, you can see it more explicitly from the gradient, in any case, um, the y hat is orthogonal projection of y onto the x plane. So that's um, often, if one thinks about linear regression problems or even some generalization of these, more complicated, that's a very useful image to have in mind. Because in a way, we're doing here something that algebraically may look a bit complicated, but that's just conceptually, in a way, orthogonal projection. So you can, you can conceptualize linear regression as orthogonal projection. So the hat matrix is in fact just a way to write down the projection operator in this n-dimensional space. Okay, and now the final chapter in, in today's lecture is the singular ve vector decomposition. So the singular vector decomposition is, is, is a way to decompose any matrix and that turns out to be super convenient in, in almost everywhere where you look in statistics and machine learning. So I wanted to introduce it already here and then maybe later on in the course we can, we can use it every now and then um, and you will see how convenient everything can become. So we said before 
five minutes ago that when X has orthonormal columns or all features are orthogonal to each other, uncorrelated, centered, then everything simplifies a lot. In fact, your whole in regression problem becomes just um, a bunch of separate linear regression problem. But usually, of course, it's not. It's, it does not have orthonormal columns. So um, can one somehow still relate to this simple example of orthonormal columns? Yes, one can, because one can transform X such that it becomes such that it has orthonormal columns, and in a way that's what singular value, singular vector um, of value decomposition does. So any matrix X. So here's now a non-trivial fact, a theorem, if you want. I'm not going to prove that. I'm just stating it. Any matrix X, X can be written as a product of three matrices U, S, V transpose. That and these uh, components U, S, and V have particular properties, which are that the matrix U has orthonormal columns, right? Every column has norm one, and every column is orthogonal to any other column. Matrix V has orthonormal columns too, and the matrix S that sits in between is a diagonal matrix that is zero everywhere apart from the diagonal, and the values on the diagonal are called singular values of matrix X. The, so the vectors that, so the columns of um, matrix U over here are called left singular vectors. The columns of, ma of um, matrix V are called right singular vectors. And uh, elements of S are called singular values. And that's how to write the condition that uh, the U has orthonormal columns, that's how to write the condition that V has orthonormal columns, and in this case, I'm assuming that X has more columns than rows, then the matrix U is also tall, it has more rows than columns, but S and V are square, and for a square matrix, if this holds, then actually this also holds, um, which we may need to discuss separately in the tutorial time. For now, we just assume that this is possible uh, to write with any matrix. So will it um, help us? Uh, OK, before I'm showing you how it will help the writing down the linear equation problems, let's, let's have a little bit of a, I want to give you a little bit of a geometric intuition behind this. Um, yeah, x equals u, s, v, t um, decomposition. So let's assume that all features and the response are centered. So remember, 10 minutes ago we talked that it's possible, we can center everything, and this doesn't really change the problem, only affects the intercept value, um, but can simplify things in, conceptually uh, in some sense. So here, on this slide, we assume that we did it. So all features are centered. And now we um, want to consider the, the SVD of, of the X matrix, um, and let's just consider two uh, feature vectors. We just have, so x has two columns, x1 and x2, and there is some correlation between them. So the x itself definitely does not have orthonormal features. Here's the points, right? There's positive correlation between x1 and x2. The SVD tells you, decomposition tells you essentially that you can rotate your head here, like that, such that if you look at this scatter plot with your head rotated, then you have features that are uncorrelated, and if you additionally squeeze them along, along the axis with your head rotated, then they will have norm one. So imagine that you basically have the scatter plot fixed and you keep rotating your head, or alternatively, and it's actually easier to imagine, at least for me, think that you have the scatter plot on a, on a piece of paper and you rotate this piece of paper. So imagine doing that. There's a positive correlation before you started, and now you rotate it, and whatever the data are, whatever the scatter plot is, at some point you will you will reach a point where the correlation is zero, right? If it's still positive, you just rotate a little bit more, um, and you will reach a point where the correlation is zero. Once you reach this point, you d you you stop, and then you squeeze every axis such that the um, norm of each um, the sum of squared values over uh, each coordinate is equal to 1. And when you did that, that's your U matrix. Now U has features that are uncorrelated and that have norm 1, 
and you can transform this back into x by unsqueezing, that's your multiplication by the diagonal elements of s, each feature gets multiplied by its own singular value, so you unsqueeze it, you stretch it in one direction, for example, um, and then v is a square orthogonal matrix, which turns out is nothing else than a rotation matrix, so then after stretching, it just takes this whole thing and rota rotates it, and then that's the x that you originally had. So the way, conceptual way to think about SVD is that you can start with something, some, so whatever data you have, you can start with something that is uncorrelated and has norm 1, then you scale it to give it any norm you want, and then you rotate it to introduce the correlations back, and that's your actual data. So for any data, you can do that. I, I hope that actually in two dimensions, it's kind of obvious that it's possible, um, but of course to prove it, in all generality requires some mathematical care. We're not going to do that. We, what we will do instead is we'll just apply this to our, um, to our setup here. So for example, you want this orthogonal projection, y hat. So that's a hat matrix times y, which is this x times x transpose x minus 1 times x transpose of y. So let's say we do the SVD of x and we just plug it in. So that's a, that's a you know, like it's a bit scary the first time you, you see this written down, but the great thing is now everything will start cancelling, and you will see how useful this is for, for analysis, um, because everything cancels. So what happens inside the brackets? U transpose U, that's 1. That's the identity matrix. We can remove it. S times S. Remember, S is the diagonal matrix, so the square of the diagonal matrix is just a matrix that has squared elements on the diagonal, so I will call it S squared. Then you have this V, S squared times V transpose. You take the inverse of that. Well, the inverse of that just turns 2 into the minus 2. Uh, I have it here. And leaves the rest intact. You can verify that if you multiply this with what you had in brackets before, you get identity matrix because V transpose V is 1 and the other way around. And now the Vs cancel again and the S... Uh, times s minus 2 times another s over here also cancel each other and you just have that. u, u transpose y. Um, so all that, that, that scary thing is, is cancels and in the end your hat matrix can be just obtained with only using left singular vectors of your x matrix and that's the orthogonal projection can be very easily written um, down in terms of the left singular vectors of x. So, convenient for computation, it may be, but can also be very convenient for, like later on, perhaps in the next lecture or in two lectures, when we start tinkering linear regression a little bit, then this will help us understand what's going on better. And another way to look at that, so this is, this is what we had in the previous slide, and now what is the beta hat itself? Well, that's almost the same thing without x in the front, and you can verify yourself that if you write it all down, that's what you're left with. Um, so that's the equation for beta hat. And I have two remarks here about that. So the first remark is that the formula, how we wrote it originally, beta hat is the inverse of this matrix times x transpose y, is good for, like, it's, it's yeah, for mathematical analysis it can be good. It's clear what's, what's happening but it is actually terrible for computations because you need to form this square matrix, which can be large if you have a lot of predictors, um, which squares everything, which can also lo lose precision. Um, and then you need to take the inverse, which is a very uh, computationally intensive operation um, that is not recommended to carry out unless you really, really have to. And in this case, you don't have to. So if you program linear regression solver, not as an exercise, you know, but in, 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 in practice, then you don't want to form this matrix and take an inverse and so on. There are much better ways, uh, computationally much faster and also um, with more accurate numerically ways to compute that. And one of the ways which may also not be the absolute best, but which is definitely better than that, is to compute the SVD of X first and then uh, do this. Okay. Um, that was remark number one. 
And remark number two is that now finally we can gain some insight uh, here from, this, uh, from the SVD manipulations. Um, if so think again about this, this, this rotation scaling that we had on the previous slide. If you have strong correlations between the features, what does it mean in terms of the scatter plot? If the correlation between x1 and x2 is large, then you just have a scatter plot that's very thinly spread out like that, right? And this means that if you do this rotation and then scale, you, you like stretch everything so that everything has norm one, then actually the singular value, one singular value, will be large. That corresponds to this direction in which you need to stretch the data a lot. But the second singular value will be very small. That's the direction in which you need to squeeze the data a lot to get this high correlation. And that holds for many features too. So if you have features that have high correlation in your regression problem, then the matrix X transpose X will have some small singular values possibly close to zero. And then you need to invert this matrix over there, or here we see it explicitly that we invert the S element, the elements of the S, so the singular values. And if some of them are small, then after inversion, they will be very large, right? So this means that the beta hat vector can get very large coefficients. And of course, if you think about the uncertainty of these estimates, then whenever you need to divide by something close to zero, your number blows up and the uncertainty also blows up. So you have large coefficients, you have high uncertainty, and you have possible numerical problems if you need to divide something that is close to zero, and it's a mess, which is why if you have strong correlations between features, it often indicates a problem, or a whole bunch of problems, for the performance of your model because of these inverses over there. And how to deal with that, um, and what it means uh, in practice, we'll be talking in the next two lectures about that. Thank you.